had long hair in the past? Oh, yeah, I've had it down, like, you know, middle back, I would say, for different touring reasons. Like, uh, early on, I just stopped getting haircuts on the road. That was kind of a, a fun time. But, yeah, I had it down to, like, here and, you know, a little farther. So what is, like, your teen years? What was the music scene at that point? What year was that, like, 80s or 90s? or? Uh, for me, it was, I mean, I'm, I'm 35 right now. Um, for, you know, my... Oh, you're young. Yeah, I know. It's weird, right? He, he looks old though. <laughs> no, it's uh, I would say like 2005 to 2010 was like, you know, the formative teen thing where I was playing in bands and stuff. But you know, I went on the road probably at 20, 19, 20, and really so never what, stopped. So when you're when you first started getting into music, because I know you said your parents played like the classic rock, like the Rascals and the Beach Boys and stuff like that. But what was popular? then because those are those are not the best years of rock like in the oh, early no. 2000s that's probably why i came out of it somewhat you know together because i just avoided what was going on completely at the time i mean i can't even tell you what was happening like beyond you know beyond some cool stuff like was that like of... red hot chili peppers and like maybe like marilyn manson was kind of big corn stuff like that i feel like i remember uh the queens of the stone age was coming out with stuff too oh yeah they were awesome and that was like a link to the rest of the good, positive music world. So I just followed that and like, and stuck to the classics. I mean, we were like in a time capsule, you know, me and my buddies back then. Okay. That must be why I thought you were a little older. Cause I was like, oh man, he like grew up on classic rock and must have, must, <laughs> must be like old, but it's just, it was your parents showing you all that stuff, which my parents showed me all that stuff too. Yeah. It was a, it was a combination of them showing things, but also just getting out of the way too. You know, at the time, you know, when you're a teenager, uh, I don't think you want to really listen to anything that your parents are going to tell you. So, and they totally understood that they're artists themselves. So they're painters and writers. So they know to stay out of the way with creativity and let, they let me find my own path in that. So, so why, eternally, and then why, why drums and why not guitar or singing? Cause I feel like guitar and singing is, I mean, that's what I tried to learn was guitar. And that was like the sexy instrument at the time. But uh, why did you pick the drums? I really can't tell you. It just showed up that way. Like when I was three or four, um, my late grandfather, even at the time, but he passed in 89. He was a multi-instrumentalist. He played everything. Guitar, bass, piano, drums, sang. Um, I kind of just got behind one of his old drum sets that I found. And for some reason, it worked. And that was good enough for me. And I stuck with that. Oh, so it's mostly you start off self-taught? Completely self-taught. Yeah, I have a maybe like two hours of formal instruction in life. And the rest is just, uh, is the way it went. Road. That's amazing though. Yeah. Because whenever I've tried to play the drum, I'm like, I can't, I mean, I played like the snare drum in like middle school marching man. And that was one thing, but like when you have multiple drum heads and the foot pedals, and I don't think people realize how complicated it is to get, do all those things at the same time. And then you also sing while you play drums too. Yeah, you know, it's it's like a, an expanded version of something everybody can do, which is drive and drive and yell at people. So it's kind of just corralling those abilities into a focused stream. You know, it's like you use your feet and your hands without thinking about it. It's just one more thing like that, you know, repetition and just having a general natural, uh, you know, tendency to be able to do that, to do that helps. But we can all do things that are interesting and like we can all... Uh, use all limbs in different ways but for music it's you know definitely it's unusual it's a little weird yeah no you're not you're not a sports guy you never played sports because that's like a lot of physical coordination to do all the drumming stuff yeah i played a little bit of baseball that was fun you know 10 years of baseball growing up did you just know that this is what you wanted to do was music for most of your life 100 percent. i i can't tell you exactly why but it just it's been that way forever that uh there's been absolutely no other plan whatsoever and no other intentions. I've never had any jobs except for one. That was, that's a funny story. We'll get, Wait, we'll I don't want to hear this story. What was the job you had? You only had one other job. What was one it? Other job ever? Um, I turned, I turned 18 and uh, immediately got arrested for drinking one beer in my hometown. So I had to get a job to pay off all those court fees and lawyer fees to get out of that. That's it. And what was the job? I worked at a boat dock in New Jersey, filling up boats with gas. Hmm. Not bad. Sounds so bad. Great. 
did you get tips and like a lot of rich people coming in with their yachts and stuff or oh yeah lots of that you know it was um the area was like uh, central jersey right by the new york harbor inlet and everything like that sandy hook new jersey and um that's yacht central people going out to see people going up, up into the hudson and stuff so it was all kinds of cool things happening and what do you, so what do you, when you look at that as a kid were you looking at those people and being like i'm gonna have a yacht one day are you like these people are freaking douchebags and the latter for sure because <laughs> nobody could drive them that's the thing like you know they either had a, had a crew or they were trying to do it themselves and it took them a half hour to park the thing so I could put gas in it. So, Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. I was just in Cabo. I was down in Cabo with my girlfriend and um, you know, it's on the water and we're walking by these docks and there's just, I mean, there's the, there, there's like a variety of boats. You got the little tiny boats and then you have these giant, I, I mean, they're almost like houses or cities on a, on a boat. I mean, these yachts are ginormous. It's amazing that uh, somebody could, have that much wealth that they could own this giant. Yeah. It's kind of cool, but also you're just like, wow. What, you're like, what does that guy do? It's gotta be a celebrity or, you know, finance guy or something. I'm like, I picked the wrong career. Yeah. Maybe. Or they're, or they're completely stressed all the time. You know, maybe that's like uh, having that many things of, of incredible scale and incredible wealth is probably stressful. Like. Yeah. Cause you're always competing. You're like, Oh, Bill's got the uh, 6,000 foot yacht. And I only have the 5,000. Damn it. You know, like, right. Is that, that's what might be. It's a never enough for yeah. some people. Yeah, sure. And maybe they're just so stressed out in life that they need to have a yacht. You know, I'd rather not have to be that stressed. I'd rather not have to afford a yacht and just be less stressed. Yeah. So playing drums. So was uh outside the box, was that kind of like the first like paid gig that you got? Yeah, that was like my, uh, my introduction into um, pretty much everything that came later. So that was my my first real band in New Jersey. I joined those guys in 2006, and um, we did pretty well around the shore area. We did the uh, the Stone Pony House Band slot for a couple of years. Went to Europe with those guys. Went to uh, you know Florida several times, all over the country um, as well. And yeah, that kind of introduced me to everything that came later, as far as wanting to keep going for sure. And it was also a formative experience because we played so many bars. Uh, um, and you never know what's going to happen in a bar. You can have to play anything. You know, it could either be, you know, a request or it could be you have to fill time or something bizarre can happen. Somebody can, you know, somebody can cancel and you got to fill their slot. So it's a good it's a good education for sure. Did you have those um, gigs where it's like the Blues Brothers were like, we play two kinds of music here, country and Western. They got the fence and the beer bottles and shit like that. I played one venue ever with a fence ever. Uh, not in that band, but it was a. Uh, where were we? Altoona, Pennsylvania. That was years later, but they had a fence. They had a chicken wire fence. Wow. And, because people threw beer bottles? Yeah, it was it was definitely like left up from the past. Like they didn't throw anything at us, fortunately, but that's good. Clearly somebody had been throwing things in the last 50 years. That's funny. So with this tell explain my audience the stone pony, because isn't that where Springsteen started? It's a famous venue. Is it not even is it still there? Yeah, it's still there. It's actually the uh one of the strongest survivors of Asbury Park. It's been through everything. Um, it's been through Asbury in its darkest days and and now some of the better days. So, uh, yeah, it's obviously most famous for the Springsteen connection. It's kind of like the Cavern in Liverpool with the Beatles, but the Jersey or U.S. version of that as far as rock and roll goes. Um, one, of, one of those clubs. But um, that's where Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes kind of operate out of still, and have they've owned that turf for 50 years now. 45, 50 years. And um, it's really the the lighthouse to old New Jersey music. That's where it has to start. It has to end. It has to come from there and at least pay tribute to that place. Stone Pony is a very special place. What other like famous bands have played there or got their start there? I mean, John Bon Jovi, of course, because, you know, he's from the same area. Um, beyond him, it's pretty much anybody you can think of. Any any act imaginable has been through there many times um over the years i mean you can look back on like steve ray vaughn's history and find he's done like 10 shows there you know before he passed of course but um you know i anybody it's, it's funny there's actually like a van halen connection to the asbury park boardwalk too which also ties into that whole scene because of uh you know eddie's involvement with kramer guitars which is based in neptune new jersey which is one town over from asbury so there's more I can even discuss about the Stump Pony that is intertwined in all of music history and Asbury Park in general. 
That's crazy. Did like Twisted Sister? Because I know they were part of the New York scene. Did they play yeah. there too? Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. Long Island guys. Yeah. And like, what about like? Did you know if Skid Row? Did they? Because that that was a New Jersey band too. Did they play there? Yeah. So Sebastian Bach is um. I think he's still a Jersey resident, but those guys kind of popped out of Red Bank, which is my hometown. Hmm. And um, that's one more cred to the area, I guess. But yes, you're right. Skid Row is a a Jersey stronghold as well. Yeah, because he grew up with uh with Bon Jovi. I mean, I just love all these little connections. And then yeah, it's all you got. They all played at the same place. That's crazy. I have to I have to check that out. I've never been to Jersey. I've only been to New York City, and I tried to do as much of it as I could in like five days. I was there. It was amazing. Yeah, it's 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 a lot. You know, you can do you could do a year there and not see half of it. It's one of those I want to I want to go to the uh, the Kevin Smith store too i don't know if it's still there but like i know he's got like a comic book store secret stash or something like that it's also in red bank my hometown oh that's, okay <laughs> that's right on broad street red bank you know? so did you growing up there did you see a lot of these musicians or celebrities like just hanging out on the boardwalk and stuff did you randomly oh yeah sure um and that's speaking of like you know formative lessons and formative years then you you realize early on Treat these people like raccoons in daytime. Leave them alone. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to be bothered. So that's the nice thing with that. It teaches you early. You see somebody. Really? Yep. Leave them alone. And Nobody's then, getting selfies, huh? No, no, no. I mean, people are. Not me. They Do they get pissed about that? I know that's like an L.A. thing, too. Like when I go to L.A., like I went to the comedy store a while back and it was like every comedian was like a famous comedian. And then I'm in the bathroom with a, I don't know if you know comedian Brian Posehn. He's like he's like a big Anthrax fan, and he he's in the bathroom right next to me. I'm like, I know that, but I didn't. I was like, ah, I don't want to ask for a selfie, but now I kind of wish that I did. So, yeah, who knows? I mean, I'm sure just like anybody else, it's based on your mood at a given time. I'm sure these guys don't want to be bothered half the time, but you know, especially in the bathroom. Yeah, that is kind of a. I mean, if especially if they're going to the bathroom, that's you might want to wait at least until they wash your hands or whatever. But so. Yeah, so that one, and you mentioned the the Southside Johnny. Now you you played with them, right? Too. Yes. So there's a, like I said, he's the godfather of the Jersey scene forever. He's the guy. He came before South. He became before Bon Jovi and before Springsteen, and kind of paved the way for them and everybody else that followed. So uh, to get a chance to work with those guys is, you know, the best school in the world for me. Um, I was invited to play on one of their albums called. Um, Songs from the Barn. It's by Southside Johnny and the Poor Fools, their Americana project, uh, about 10 years ago. And that was kind of like another stepping stone and springboard into, you know, whatever came next and however it came next. But I've learned more from those guys than I could learn from any school or any book. That is, uh, they are the absolute sort of beacon of uh, of instruction, you know, nonverbal instruction that's kept yeah. me going. So I can't take them enough. Well, and all these things, I feel like they're stepping stones. Like, so that, that first gig that you got the outside the box, like, how did you get that? Cause that, that kind of led to the South side and then, you know, these other things, how did you get the first gig? Cause I heard you say, I thought you heard, uh, heard you say that you never auditioned for any bands. Yeah. Never had to audition for anything beyond like just a, a little bit of kind of get in the room with so-and-so and see how it feels. Mm -hmm. um, it's less of an audition, more of just a, a chemistry project at that point. But um, the first gig with OTB happened, um, they needed a new drummer for whatever reason, which I still really don't know why they just kind of, uh, needed a guy, but, um, right place, right time. You know, uh, I have a cousin who runs a deli in Spring Lake, New Jersey, Joseph's deli. And, um, one of the guys in the band's father was delivering produce to that deli and voiced his concern that his son's band needed a new drummer. And I happened to be in the card somehow. And, uh, my name got brought up and got into the band. <laughs> and then you're in that. And then that leads to OTB. And then, um, and then to explain to my audience, this other band that you were in hellbound glory. Cause you guys toured with uh kid rock and buck cherry and you called it uh gruntry. It's like grunt country. Yeah. It's not, a, not an official term yet, but uh, you know, it might make hats or something, but uh, yeah. Uh, hellbound glory is um, I guess by nature, a country band that, Pulls from all areas. They pull from metal. They pull from, um, obviously, grunge. They'll pull from hip-hop. They'll pull from anywhere. And um, one of the most eclectic bands I've ever been in in my entire life and some of the coolest people I've ever met, too. Um, Leroy Virgil's the singer and frontman of that band, and he is a uh, 
he is a he's a very very brilliant writer amazing writer and amazing singer and um i did probably five years with those guys on the road and um i'll never forget it you know very very cool stuff very uh very unique world to to, to yeah. kind of dip into and learn about that whole scene because it's very different than most other scenes yeah well, and because they're actually from aberdeen same place as nirvana's from Exactly. Yeah. Have you ever been to Aber? I see. I'm from Washington. I lived like, uh, you know, two hours Seattle area outside of. Uh, I've been to Aberdeen a couple times. My girlfriend, I took her there, and she thought it was beautiful. But I was like, well, this is the summer because usually it's very dark and dreary. I've never been there. Uh, we've been booked there like ten times, and uh, for some reason, it keeps shaking us off. Like uh, something will happen. It'll be like you know the venue closed or something like that. Like or uh, blizzards coming up through the. Uh, over the mountains from Reno or something like that. Some weird thing. We've never made it to Aberdeen as, um, as that band, you know, in that time. But, uh, I'd like to go. I mean, it's definitely like a place where, you know, speaking of like pilgrimages, like the cavern, that's, that's one of America's most important places musically Aberdeen, you know, and that whole region. So I'll, I'll get there. Yeah, definitely check it out. Uh, if you want to like, see it when it's like more beautiful, go in the summer. If you want to see it, like when it actually like this is the real Aberdeen. I feel like you got to go in like October, November when it's all dark and dreary. It'd be kind of cool. Yeah, count me in. I'll, I'll fly out there for uh, for anything at this point. Yeah. So yeah, talk about those years though that you toured with the uh, uh, Hellbound Glory because uh, with Kid Rock and stuff. Did you become friends with those guys at all? Like I had Kenny Olson, the guitar player. I don't know if he was the guitar player when you toured with them, but he's a pretty cool guy. Uh, Marlon was out with us. I think there was another guy too. It might've been Kenny. I'm not sure. We were living to a totally separate kind of, uh, oil and water travel, uh, you know, plans. Uh, we were the opening band for one of three. So it was us, Buck Cherry, then Kid Rock. And most nights we were out of there by the time Buck Cherry went on, you know, to get to the next town and all that. So, um, yeah, we got to meet those guys a little bit and hang out. We had, a, um, a pretty cool night in New Orleans. Uh, we all stayed there one night and like, I guess they got like a big townhouse as a rental and they invited us to the, the pool party. That was fun. But, um, you know, beyond that, it was really businesslike and just kind of, you know, come do your job. Don't blow it. And then uh, we'll see you at the next show. Wow. That sounds amazing. A pool party in New Orleans with Kid Rock and Buck Cherry. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah that was one, one special night that was uh, that I remember like everything up until midnight after that one and then i remember being in birmingham somehow i don't know what happened have you ever seen kid rock's house like he has like a replica of the white house or the oval office it's, like, it's really bizarre yeah i've heard about it uh, i'm that's in michigan i'm sure but uh yeah on that yeah, he's a interesting guy he's a you know i think he goes as bob right bob Ritchie, i think is his real name you know at the time a very very uh sort of calm dude just hanging out doing his thing and going to work yeah super talented i mean because you talk about like with hellbound glory it's it's kind of the same thing like where he does country and he he does rap and he does rock and he's kind of all over the place i like that kind of eclectic sound for for bands it's i mean if they can pull it off you got to be talented to do it yeah there's a song we did with hellbound glory called college girls that's out um on spotify and everywhere that I believe Kid Rock had a hand in producing. Um, I lent my my drumming to it early on, then it, it took its course and went up the up the uh, ladder in the production process. But I think he has a hand in that, and that's kind of like a collection of things that represent him and uh, Hellbound Glory. Just it's a, it's a hodgepodge in a good way. Cool. Tunes. That's that's really cool. Did you guys also tour with ZZ Top? We did two shows with ZZ Top and Kid Rock at pine knob in detroit um in 2013 so the rebel soul tour that we did with buck cherry and kid rock was three months early in 2013 and then uh kid rock called us back for like the blowout hometown shows in detroit later that year in the summer and those were yeah that was us zz top and kid rock and uh two shows i'll never forget those fantastic nights that's awesome and then so then that somehow led to you getting the gig with uh, Matthew Curry or how did, how did that one come about? That, that was just a, a management thing. Um, at the time, Hellbound Glory had a manager that uh, was also getting into managing other artists. And uh, Matthew was one of those artists. He was, uh, 
the up and comer and they needed a band and uh, some downtime was going on with Hellbound. So I kind of just got the call, blew myself out to Chicago and met Matthew and those guys. And we actually hit the road the next day to go to the Troubadour in LA. We rehearsed once, jumped in a van and drove three days together. So no better way to meet each other than that. So <laughs> you get to know two other guys really well, you know, yeah. going through the desert and stuff. Yeah, that's cool. I, ju- I was just listening to uh, him on Spotify right before the uh, interview. I was like, oh, this stuff is good. I don't know. I can't recommend uh, f- what people like if, you know, if they are following you for David Lee Roth or whatever. I don't know if they it crosses over, but it does for me. I thought it was great. It's kind of like Tom Petty, kind of classic rock, kind of bluesy. St- I-, I liked it. It was really cool. Yeah, he's a. Uh... He's great. You know, he's my, uh, you know, he keeps me working more than anybody these days, really. Um, and myself, him and the guys in that band, that's we're we're very much a brotherhood at this point. And um, we kind of operate out of that circle with everything. And Matt's cool enough to kind of let me bring some of my friends into the mix, too. Like keyboard player Mark Macefield, for example. He's from Jersey from my original band and uh, outside the box. And he actually plays with Dave Hawes now, a great singer songwriter check him out but uh um yeah matt's like sort of a breeding ground for all, all things music and all things cool like it's an open door very uh very family oriented and we get to do we can play what we want in that band we can do what we want you know and i love being on the road with those guys yeah i mean they must uh be a fan or uh these these bigger bands must be a fan of matthew because you open for you know doobie brothers steve miller band peter frampton all these these guys must uh, be a fan of him or they Matthew just has really good uh, manager or something like, I, I don't know how that works. Uh, yeah. I think it's a little bit of both um, early on. Like we were doing those tours, 2015, 16, 17 with doobies Frampton, all those guys. And um, I think it probably started in the management zone. Like, you know, here, let's put this young guitar player on these obvious gigs. But uh, I think that Matt won those guys over too. I think he, yeah, he, uh, he made friends with, you know, all the aforementioned guys and and they saw something in him that reminded them of themselves and they kept bringing us out, you know, even beyond the management's hand. So um, another really cool time period for, for Matthew and for all of us. Yeah. Well, I saw this picture you posted on Instagram. It was like, you guys played this festival in Telluride and it just looks so beautiful. I was like, wow. Is that like a, one of the most memorable gigs that you had? It is. Um, First of all, you're at 9,500 feet, I think, or a little more, depending on which part of the mountain you're on. And so it's a whole different balance of playing because for singers, it's you're, you're you're not getting the oxygen that you need usually in the I mountain. I thought of that. I, I mean, I heard of that with uh, with like football, with sports and stuff. They say, oh, you don't get as much oxygen. I didn't think about it with singers, though. Yeah, singers. And for me, too, as a drummer, it's, you know, it's relatively physical. So, um, yes, you're in this incredible environment. You're up in the mountain. It's beautiful. Um, and, and at moments the veil is pulled over that with this, uh, sudden need for oxygen. <laughs> Did they give you one of those, like, see, we've stayed in, um, uh, what is the, the town and it's right on the board Durango in this yeah. hotel and they had the, uh, the little oxygen, like tanks that you could borrow and you could like, you like suck in the oxygen if you need it. I was like, I didn't think uh, Durango was that high up, but. So yeah, those oxygen tanks are basically as common as water bottles in the cooler. They're just there. <laughs> If you need one, uh, you just take a hit and, you know, you're back. Um, for me, though, like playing at, at a mountain, I mean, that's the weirdest and most interesting landscape ever to play at because the stage is facing yeah. the mountain. It looks so cool. The picture you posted, I was like, wow, I want to come. What is that? Is Player uh, Ride Festival, it's called, right? Yeah, Ride Festival. Um, to go to that. It looks amazing. Yeah, it's it's a uh, we've been we've been lucky the couple of years we've done it. The headline has been Pearl Jam and Cheryl Crow. So it was a whole big thing. Like a whole and you played with them. We opened the day. So we were the first or second band. That counts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so those guys were the headliners. And like seeing that in the mountains is very different than seeing it on flat land or anywhere else, because it's you know the story. It's it's everybody's up there for the right reason. Everybody's traveled up a mountain to go see music and it's not like he went there by accident so what a dedicated fan base and like super focused and everybody's just really just completely consuming the music and that's nice to see and nice nice to be part of too yeah i want to see a show at red rocks too that was on my bucket list i was gonna go see tom petty 
at the Red Rocks, but it was like four hundred or five hundred dollars for just like a, the basic ticket, not like you know front. This was like the cheapest ticket I could find it was like four hundred bucks, and I was like, I I can't afford that. And then he died like three months later or something like that. I was like, shit, I should have just pulled the trigger. Yeah, that's a bummer. Right after the end of the tour, you know, that was like at least he finished the tour, but I one of my all time favorites, Tom Petty. I've seen him like ten times all over Jersey, New York, and things like that. But um, what a loss. What an absolute loss that is. That's uh, that's going to become musical language and become standard musical uh, dialogue in the next 500 years. Tom Petty's catalog is that important. It's never going anywhere. It's it's permanent. Yeah, you talk about like going back to like celebrities walking out. I heard he did not like being a celebrity. He He didn't like going out to dinner because he'd go out to dinner and people would – come up to him and say oh my god you're tom petty and like it made him like super uncomfortable so like i think he just didn't go out very much from what i understand could be you know i i, I get that i i can see him being like that you know super kind of i mean privacy is everything i'd imagine at that point so if you don't have that you have nothing the rest of your life is on broadcast so it's got to be you know your own little world on your own terms so i totally yeah. respect. and he's so unique looking like i feel like it'd be hard to disguise yourself and i i would have maybe if he would have lived a little longer he could have lived through the pandemic and just put a face mask on and then like nobody would have known it was him yeah that's i think a lot of guys probably were among us during the pandemic and we didn't even know it you know? right i would think that would be like the the best time to be a celebrity you're like oh I, I, can we keep this pandemic this is amazing i can go outside nobody cares who i am like would have been nice yeah uh so then oh yeah so then explain um how you got the David Lee Roth gig. So you got a call from the, um, the bassist. Yeah. Um, uh, bassist is Ryan Wheeler and he's the musical director, um, for our band. And, um, at the time it was really just more of the same, right? So like they needed a new, a new drummer for whatever reason, something had happened in the camp and they needed a, a new guy. So, um, I was kind of just next on the, you know, on the list and I got the call and jumped in the seat. But how did they, so Ryan knew you or did Dave, was he aware of you or how did they know of you? Yeah, Ryan was aware. I mean, I've known him for a long time and worked with him on various things. And um, he's from New Jersey as well, originally. So that's how we know each other. And I think the idea of, of not taking any more chances at that critical moment, like they had lost the other guy for whatever reason and uh, they needed somebody who could definitely played with this band definitely played with ryan in the rhythm section and um i'd done that before so i think i was a safe bet in that moment and um maybe not intentionally the permanent fix but i came in did the job and then i kind of just got asked to stay was that intimidating uh the first time you you meet roth i mean because you've been in other bands and you've played with all these other big artists but this is like you're you're playing in the band for david lee roth i mean he's one of the biggest rock stars of all time I don't know. It really wasn't any different than meeting another band leader, you know, and in that moment you have to treat it that way because it just really is that this is the man who's going to be fronting the presentation that you're part of. And it's your job to kind of drive the car. And it doesn't really matter who's up there. You got to do the same job no matter what. And that's how <laughs> we all treat but it. He's, you know? such a, he's such a, a unique guy from what I heard. I mean, I read uh, our mutual friend. I mean, I read Darren's book about I, I know so much about david lee roth i feel like now and i mean i i've heard other stories from other people like desmond child that said you know he went to go meet him and he comes in with these like two strippers with him like does he always bring strippers with him but did he bring strippers when he met you the first time i, I haven't gotten a single stripper yet i don't know what? what's wrong nothing no strippers wow Not yet. So I, I guess i gotta hang on a little bit longer to get the strippers and the midgets oh maybe I'm he's uh maybe he's yeah. grown up a little bit maybe he's he's matured he's a different david lee roth I mean, he's he's a very, very, very good guy to work for. I can say that. You know, That's and, awesome. And I loved it. So how you haven't done a lot of shows with them, but how were the shows that you did? You guys opened for you. You were you were able to do some of those shows that were open for Kiss, right? We did. I think it was 29 with Kiss. Um, 29 with Kiss. And we were scheduled for Vegas that year. Obviously, the pandemic took a chunk out of that. But, but um, yeah, it was great. You know, it was everything you'd want it to be, everything you'd hope it to be from our perspective and uh, a total pleasure to play those songs and a total blast. 
and um those songs let you play them too you can you can take those wherever you want and they'll behave and they're they're just they're, they're made that well the whole catalog is just rock solid so you can you can play it as hard as you want and it'll always take the punch I've never seen a Roth solo show. Does he uh, allow you to do a drum solo or is it guitar solos or is it just the songs? It's the songs. We're playing, um, you know, exactly what you'd hope to hear. Just one after the other. Rapid fire, you know, keep moving. And uh, certainly no drum solos. I hate drum solos, personally. Oh, really? <laughs> you don't like, my... that, like you like a, you don't aren't a fan of any drum solos like uh, John Bonham or Neil Peart or any of those guys that are in the past that have done the drum solo, the Tommy Lee, like upside down roller coaster drum solo. Oh, I, I, I totally love those and appreciate those. And that's like, that's an incredible art form. That's like, um, that's like a different kind of art, you know? So that's, that's what those guys do. And that's, you know, an amazing feat. But for me, I, I like to play songs. I stick to the songs and stick to the groove and, do my job that way. That's, that's where I like to work from. You don't like to be, do you do stick twirling or anything? You don't like to be noticed. I, I mean, noticed is not bad, but as far as like noticed for the wrong thing, I'd rather be, you know, within the music instead of on top of the music. If that makes have sense. Ever, have you ever seen Zoltan Chaney? I don't think so. Oh, after we get off this interview, uh, look up on YouTube, Zoltan Chaney drummer. Uh, he played with, uh, he played with slaughter and he played with Vince Neil. Uh, and that guy is crazy. Like he, he's like animal from the Muppets. Like he's just all over the place. He's like stands on a stool and like jumps and, and it's just, he's so physical. It's really fun to watch. I don't know if technically he's a good drummer. I couldn't tell you that, but I, I know that he's very entertaining to watch. And I like, I like those kind of drummers, but it sounds like you kind of like to let, play it a little cooler. Yeah. I mean, I, it, there's a place for everything. Like I, whatever your thing is, do it to the max. It's awesome. Like it, yeah, we should all do that. If you have something, run with it as far and far and fast as you can. But my version of that is just I, I love playing songs. I love playing music with other people. That's it. I have no real desire to be uh, anything more than that. And Roth, kind of, does Roth direct you when you're playing with him? Hey, play it like this, do this, like, you know, cut that out, uh, you know, more cowbell, whatever. Like, does he tell you how to play the drums at all? Is it just like, hey, do your thing? It's a lot of do your thing, a lot of go out there and just kind of, you know, you know this, so just go do it. But uh, yeah, we rehearsed, you know, we rehearsed for the um, the other Vegas residency that was also canceled at the end of the pandemic. Uh, we rehearsed for six months for that one. And uh, that was that was like going to the dojo. That was awesome. We did a lot of um, a lot of work on the show and it was going to be a really, really cool show. Yeah, and, I'm so mad. My, you know, like our friend Darren was going to fly down for that. I had another friend that was going to go to that. And then I was kind of thinking, well, maybe I should go because Vegas is only five hours from me. I'm in Phoenix now. And it's like, or is there any chance those shows will be rescheduled? I have no idea. Uh, your guess is as good as mine right now. I haven't heard anything, but uh, it'd be nice. Cause it was uh, what was it? 20, was it 2021? No. Was it March, 2020 when it was originally, when were they originally supposed to go? 2021, right? Originally they did some, that was before I was in the band. They did okay. some in February, I think, or January, one or the other. Um, right. Then we had March 2020 mid Kiss tour that got canceled, of course. And then we had a rescheduled and sort of rebooted um, New Year's plan for 2021 going into 22. Yeah. The, That's uh, what it was. December 31st, 2021. Um, shows of the House of Blues. <sighs> Yeah. That would have been amazing. Yep. Cool venue. Yeah, I've seen I've seen Steel Panther there. They used to have free shows in Mandalay Bay, House of Blues. It was literally free. I mean, you, the, of course, the drinks are like $15 or whatever, but it was awesome because I go see Steel Panther, and every time I'd see him, it was a different show. Have you ever seen Steel Panther? I haven't. I, I'm a big fan, though. I've, I've, uh, I've stayed tuned to their world and a uh, huge fan. Yeah, I think uh, I would highly recommend it because it's such a different kind of thing. It's yes, there's the music and they do the covers phenomenal and they do their own music and it's funny. But then it's like they do this little like comedy routine in between the songs. And like I said, I've seen them, I don't know, like 20 times or something. It's always a different bit. It's never the same stuff that they just have like lines. I don't know if it's like scripted the day before or they just do it on the spot, but it's always different. It's amazing. 
that's the beauty of live music, right? We lost that for a couple of years in, in the pandemic, which was, um, you know, it's, it was horrible then, but it also, it's like you realize how much you missed it and how much you love it. So it might've been a good wake up call in the long term. So we, we admire and treasure these things a little more as they come at us now. Absolutely. Well, are you still, so you're still technically the drummer for David Lee Roth band, right? I mean, if it, cause he has not officially retired. I know he said he was going to, but like he just kind of canceled those shows and then he never did like the final retirement shows. No, no, no retirement yet. As far as I know, unless it's a, you know, unless it's a silent retirement, but uh, no, yeah. The band is still the band as far as I know. And uh, it's sort of a, uh, you know, a time capsule now. If, if something happens down the road, I'll be there. If not, it was great. Oh man. I hope it happens. Like I, I, I feel like I got I've never seen Roth solo. I've only seen him one time with Van Halen on the reunion and it was, it was good, but of course I was in the nosebleed. So I think it'd be cool to see the solo and then you can hear all the solo songs too, that he obviously is not going to do those with Van Halen. Yeah. It was a lot of fun to play gigolo. Of course, that was like uh, a highlight for me every night. So I recommend seeing it if it ever happens again. Yeah. You said unchained was the, kind of the only one that was a little quirky to play yeah you know it was a it, it was one of those things like the only thing in the set that was like interesting to uh to navigate and it was like early in the show so it was no problem but like and after that you can just lean into it and have fun but yeah unchained you gotta watch it a little bit it's not as easy as you think yeah that well i would fun. think i wonder too like because you know you, you hear that he said he's gonna retire and those were the retirement shows but also like he could just be like, you know what? Uh, I don't want to retire. And he could come out and he could write new material. That would be fun if you actually got to record with David Lee Roth. We recorded the uh, the live stuff at Henson, which was yeah. out. Uh, yeah, I mean, sure. Anything new. Like new did. material, though. That There was nothing new on that one, right? It was all. It was, we went in there and did a couple of hours and we just played the set. That was it. We did it live 100 percent. And uh, that was that. It came out the way it came out. And I. I had a blast. Yeah, that's awesome. So then you're still um, right now. You got uh, shows lined up with Matthew Curry. Is that anything else that you have on tap? Yeah, I have a lot of Matthew Curry shows. We're leaving for a tour um, on February 1st. We're going to Florida. That's going to take us around the whole um, East Coast as well, including a cruise, the Rock Legends cruise, which leaves from Miami and goes down to Dominican Republic. I was so, looking at, I think I, oh, I wanted to go to that, but I think it's sold out. Same with the uh, Monsters of Rock. All these cruises are sold out. I didn't realize, I've never been on a cruise I wanted to go. And I'm like, oh, I guess you got to like buy these tickets like the day they come out or something. There might still be a few uh, tickets or cabins left for Rock Legends Cruise. If you uh, take a look at that, I can send you some links as well. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll definitely check that out. Yeah, because yeah. I've never been on a cruise. I've always wanted to do it. That'd be fun. Is it Sammy Hagar playing that one too? Yeah, exactly. He's the... Uh, <laughs> He's the headliner. We got Rick Springfield, Billy Gibbons, and a ton of others too, you know. Um, so that's cool. It's literally a captive audience. Everybody's in the same boat. So you um you get to know everybody really throughout the course of the five days in the on the water. So um it's like nothing else. I mean, it's pretty cool. I've got some, I've made some great friends on the boat over the years, and like um I'm looking forward to seeing them and seeing new people and meeting new people and uh and playing the shows. But um other than Matthew, I have a few really cool things going on as well. Um, we're planning a uh, tour of the Netherlands with an artist named Joanne Bird, who's a Dutch artist, singer, songwriter, who um, thankfully allowed me to produce some of her new music that is coming out later this month. So um, we're getting that together, putting the whole show together and uh, preparing for that release. Yeah, because you're a music producer, too. You play a little bass and do a little piano. You produce uh, the latest Matthew, or you co-produce with Matthew Curry, his latest album? Yes, Open Road by Matthew Curry. I, uh, I co-produced that with him. We did it in Illinois, in his hometown, and um, really got everything we wanted to put onto that record in one place. So that was a nice um, a nice process. Speaking of Tom Petty, we kind of, we, we took that model of like, chilled out recording, relaxed, let's make a clubhouse environment and go work. So um very proud of that record where was it recorded bloomington illinois oh, okay so do you re do you record things because you're in nashville now right yeah do you record things down there is there i'm assuming there's a lot of studios down there 
yeah, endless studios. I think they're building new ones literally every day. I mean, it seems like something new pops up all the time. But uh, this is a great place to work. If you have um, something you need to get done right now, you can do it right now. Just make a few phone calls and and you'll be working in no time. And like, it's it's like an assembly line for music here. You can get anything you need at all hours. It's great. Do you network with a lot of other Nashville musicians, like hang out with them and or see them out and about? Oh yeah, I got plenty of uh, of uh, you know, acquaintances and friends down here over the years. It's uh, people I've met on the road who've also moved here. People who I've known from Jersey who move here. Um, yeah, and you just kind of get together and jam and see what happens. In fact, I'm headed to New York tomorrow to do a show with uh, an artist named Vibin Sibin in the Sunlight Band, and um, he's a former East Coast guy from Virginia, and just through hanging out and jamming at his house we kind of uh stumbled into this pretty cool project that he was nice enough to bring me into so we got some nice shows with him coming up too oh that's awesome well i look forward to uh following your career and seeing what comes up next and hopefully some of those roth shows hopefully he comes back because that would be cool to see but whatever else you're doing i'm it's i'm a fan i'm a fan of matthew curry now too just listening to him i was like oh this is awesome i love this stuff so yeah i'll have to check that out if you guys hit phoenix we usually try to you know, we come west, we go to LA, and hopefully on the way out there, we'll we'll see you. Which venue do you go when you go to Phoenix? Uh, well, Tempe, we did a what's that called? The Marquee. Marquee, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, that's a pretty good, big size venue then. Wow. Yeah, we've opened for people there a few times. We opened for uh, Hinder there. Oh, time, yeah. I had the drummer. I think the drummer of Hinder on Cody. I think his name is. Could be. Yeah, I think so. They're cool. All right. Well, thanks so much. Anything else you want to promote? That's it for me. And again, to keep an eye on the schedule, you know, um, Matthew Curry, uh, Joanne Bird from Holland, keep an eye on her career. Great things are happening for her. And, um, you know, beyond that, every day is a new day. So keep looking for new stuff. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. I'll see you later. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the full podcast episode. Please help support our guests by following them on social media and purchasing their products, whether it be a book, album, film, or other thing. And if you have a few extra dollars, please consider donating it to their favorite charity. If you want to support the show, you can like, share, and comment on this episode on social media and YouTube. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can give us a rating and review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. Finally, make sure you're subscribed to the show on YouTube for the video versions and other exclusive content. We appreciate your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.